So I would like to welcome everybody who is already joined. Um, we're glad to have you here in the middle of the fall at a time when the days get shorter and more foggy. Our office in Vienna, our Semmelweis office and our little studio is in the 13th floor of a building next to the Ministry of Health. And typically we have a fantastic view over, over the city, over the Danube channel. And today it is mostly foggy uh, due to the seasonal weather situation. Um, it's also a time when infections, infection numbers tend to increase. Not so much uh, HAI, but definitely respiratory tract infections, including COVID. Um, in, in my company, um, a quarter of the people are just now uh, COVID positive. Fortunately, none of them has severe symptoms, but of course they have to stay at home a couple of days uh, before they come back to work. So this is this is the time. And uh, when I look back a year and a half, when Professor Pite and many others uh, predicted how the pandemic will, will develop, um, they got it pretty right. They pretty much predicted um, how the pandemic will turn into an epidemic or endemic situation over time. Unfortunately, we are already in a situation that is much easier than a year ago or especially two years ago. Um, COVID-19 will also play an important role in today's lectures. Um, we, For those of you uh, who are new to this uh, Semmelweis talk to this uh, format, we started in spring 2022 to organize the so-called Semmelweis talks on a regular basis every four to six weeks, uh, covering relevant and important topics of hospital hygiene, infection prevention, hand hygiene, surveillance, and others. The red paste talks, uh, they last for around an hour and a half. Typically, we have three speakers, and after the lectures, we have a short discussion with the speakers. If there are questions from the auditory, they will be put into the chat, and we will read them and discuss them with our lecturers. Thanks to the support of Schulke, we could organize these lectures in 2022, and we also plan to connect these uh, series of lectures in 2023. Um, for those of you um, who, who are new, we also record the lectures and we put the presentations as well as the video on our web page. So if somebody has missed a lecture or wants to see sections again, www semmelweis.info and then you click uh, events and you, you, you get all the information and all the videos from, from these lectures. This time I'm very pleased and honored to announce Andreas Voss from Groningen. He's our keynote speaker today. I'm glad to announce Emma Shishilagi, medical director of the Peter Fire Hospital in Budapest and an old friend of the Semmelweis organization as well and Jakub Kotzak, um, from a very interesting Czech startup company, Datelow. And before I go into the details to introduce the three lecturers and then start off the lectures, I would like to have a quick look back. Six weeks ago, um, on September 20th, we had the last Semmelweis talk, and it was our pleasure to have Petra Gastmeier here speaking about the past and the future of HAI surveillance. We had Jana Karevic here from the Clinical Center in Serbia, and we had Seven Agdesi here again from Charité in Berlin, which was a very nice uh, package of lectures covering this topic of surveillance. Uh, we also tried to involve speakers from everywhere, international speakers like Andreas Voss, but also local speakers from the countries like Emesche or Jakub, who are from the CEE region, because that's one of the focus areas of the Semmelweis Foundation. We discussed it many times. The advantage of having a web conference is that everybody can stay at home, grab his or her favorite coffee, and everybody knows exactly how to find the toilet. The big disadvantage is that we cannot meet in person and have the coffee together or a beer in the evening, but we hope that fairly soon we will be able to organize a Semmelweis conference in person as we had in the past and also meet in person because I think the community building and the personal exchange with all the experts is extremely important. But with this little introduction, let me right away start with our first lecture, 
it is my utmost pleasure to introduce Andreas Voss to you, knowing that most people will already know him. Still, um, Andreas is professor and chair of the Department of Clinical Microbiology and Infection Control at the University Med Medical Center in Groningen. He is presently the president of the International Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. He was one of the co-founders of ICPIC, the uh, biannual conference in Geneva that you all know. He is founding editor of the BMC journal Antimicrobial Resistance and Infection Control. He has over 350 peer-reviewed journals under his name. He is an international top, top expert for infection prevention, hand hygiene, and also behavioral exchange. And Andreas will speak to us about the influence of COVID-19 on multi-drug-resistant organisms and infection control, as you can see on the first slide. So, Andreas, please. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Bernard. And yes, I already put up my, my slide while you were talking. Sorry for that, but I wanted to make sure that it's working and it's there. So the topic influence on COVID-19 on MDROs and infection control. And uh, I will try to, to give you my kind of view of that topic over the next few minutes. So what are the, the, the COVID related changes? And then obviously we're talking about uh, the, the focus on IPC, infection prevention and control. And if I look into that, the uh, first thing is that really our our work in uh, IPC got the attention of absolutely everyone. So there is something to say for a pandemic, uh, including the media and the man on the street. Everyone knows about infection control by now. And and uh, yeah, you could say the good thing is that the Dutch by now have 17 million experts who know what to do with regard to infection control, which at some points can be quite uh, uh, in the way, but still uh, it's really everywhere. Uh, IPC was finally considered as important. So uh, during the last two years, I believe that we had contact with everyone from our own hospital administrators to politics. Uh, suddenly, IPC experts were considered as an important group of uh, medical healthcare workers that you actually need. And then we thereby gained a new status. So uh, uh, I have never been in my life so many times on TV. So uh, I obviously, you, you, not, from now on, I have to watch out uh, not to get recognized. But uh, no, it, 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 you complete a new status for all the IPC professionals. And the most important one is the one within your own healthcare setting where you're actually being listened to. Our research got funding. That's another thing. It was very easy to get. If you have a good idea on COVID related issues, you suddenly got funding without any problem. And uh, money that was uh, really was no issue to to realize uh, needed changes and you already know me saying never waste a perfect storm also known as pandemic to finally get what you always needed so uh, like our, our molecular diagnostic is is up to date and uh, in a way we would have never reached without this pandemic so this you could say are some of the changes but there were other changes. There was uh, a lot of help uh, wanted and needed and everyone was hiring. And not all of those hires were like, let's say in, in, in my favor, like public health service were literally swallowing infection control capacity, uh, which was needed in the hospitals too. Uh, the market shares with regard to diagnostic and prevention of infectious disease completely changed due to COVID. So as I say, public health entered uh, especially long-term care. Uh, and, and that was important, and especially also important, you could say that long-term care finally recognized uh, the importance of IPC for their clients. So that was uh, certainly good, while the beginning was really, really bad for, for the long-term care. care. Uh, they, they really weren't prepared for a pandemic and for the need of infection control. Uh, unfortunately, during that time, IPC professionals were choosing to render the services private corporation instead of healthcare employees. So uh, uh, that is one of the things when help is needed everywhere, what can happen. And commercial bulk labs entered the market to help with testing. 
and that in in itself is of course really good that that uh, that they came to help uh but there is something that i i say is the covid boost in in this change of of laboratory services uh that was really well um put into a an opinion opinion uh article in trau which is a dutch uh, newspaper by uh, Wertheim and Friedrich, and they said that commercial labs to build capacity for SARS-CoV-2 PCR testing with a budget in the Netherlands that was bigger than the yearly budget of all other Dutch uh, medical microbiology laboratories for the complete range of 24-7 diagnostic consultancy and infection control. And then it's always a big question what to do with these kind of high output labs after COVID. And I think that the Austrian people will recognize Live Brain as a laboratory that was doing all the Austrian work. Uh, it's fantastic. They, they offered a 24-7 service. They did up to 500 tests per day, which I found absolutely amazing that you can do that. But again here, what, what to do with laboratories like this once a crisis is over? Uh, and and uh, we could go on for that forever. Uh, but that is might be a problem for an, an, a major change within healthcare systems. But also got into the picture positively, you could see that uh, uh, the use of, of personal protective equipment uh, came into the picture. Certainly mask and the difference among them became a, a hot topic to everyone. And you can see it from art to politics and then not all politicians kind of did it use it in the right form, I would say. And uh, I'll hope that the last person will never do it again with what he's busy right now. But uh, uh, yeah, masks really were in the picture and in 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 view of everyone. So uh, thus COVID brought along a lot of positive changes. I can give you a clearly yes, no to that or ye no. Uh, there is no real answer. I believe there are some changes that you can consider negative COVID related changes. Number one, the protection of healthcare workers uh, themselves are of healthcare workers themselves became an important motivator to follow IPC guidelines. And we all we know from history that that's not a good idea. During SARS once in Hong Kong, uh, Cito sent me his great, great slides where he said during SARS one outbreak in Hong Kong, MRSI outbreaks in the hospital were increasing due to the fact that people were thinking about protecting themselves instead of our patients, where PPE also was made for, not also, primarily was made for to protect the patients. Uh, then the scarcity hit healthcare, and all rules and habits changed immediately and flew out of the window, I would say. The continuous use of masks and gowns, we have we have preached for years that we shouldn't do that, that we should change after every patient. Reuse of all kinds of materials. Think about the masks, gowns, ventilation tubes, instruments. In my healthcare setting, and I still was on an old place in Nijmegen at that time, we had 48 items previously for single use converted to re-sterilization or reuse in the light of the procurement issues. So all rules weren't followed at that time and i'm afraid that we will feel that that you that people can bend rules and and and, and discard uh, habits uh, when needed and they will make their own rules and say who cares because we have done it during COVID too and then of course we had the whole mask the the the, the examples of how not to do it uh, but there were so many things where should i carry my mask if not in my pants uh, pockets uh, i mean uh, and and we a lot of men of, might have been guilty of that too, or is uh, is a week of use really too much for for one mask? Who says? Or this gentleman said, do we still need to wash our hands, or can we finally take a shower? So all the 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 guidance we was trying to give were were kind of miscrewed and and differently interpreted. And I remember that at the beginning of COVID, I was on national TV explaining how to use a mask. That was in the beginning of 2020. I believe that by the end of 2020 uh, and all through 21 and 22, I and the rest of the Netherlands ignored every single one of those instructions. And I'm guilty myself. So just imagine, guess what healthcare workers will do over the next years? 
when we tell them that they should use a mask only once or that they should not continue in the same gown to someone else. And we're so used to doing that now for two years. It will be very, very tough to bring back or stop this bad habit. So, and some saw the change as a chance and, and MDROs, multi-drug resistant organisms, are one of those. If you look into the, the MDROs in the northern region where I now work, and the first slide is mainly thought about the ESBL to look at them, that you can see that at the beginning of Q2, at the end of Q, Q1 and 2020, the numbers were going down. And that went on all through, through, through the time. And actually, we know that now over the whole COVID period, the overall number of ESBLs in the northern region of the Netherlands, where I work, was lower than in the time from before. So something happened there, and it was mainly due for, for ESBLs, with the exception of Klebsiella. So all other ESBL uh, producing uh, uh, microorganisms, and they were just lower in that time. And we don't know, uh, uh, sorry, they then, uh, um, sorry, and there, there was, uh, they, they were lower, so there's a mistake in the things. They were, the, the ESBL was a little bit higher uh, for, for a short time, but in, the, in total, as I've seen from this picture, it was, was, it was a lower thing. And, and if you see more gram negatives, and those you see, you can ask, why did we see them? And I think that one important reason for some of the microorganisms we did see increase is a change in population mix, because we not only had COVID, we now only have uh, uh, a completely different population. Close to my hospital is the, the refugee center of the Netherlands. We see a lot of those patients, uh, and, and they bring in a lot of gram-negative resistance. So what we saw, actually had to do with that population. And we try to, to show that by, by actually showing that over the time, we, we just correlated is with a, with a citizen number and all the refugees obviously have not a citizen number at that time yet. So we have due to privacy, no better data and no better way to do it. So we compared the ESBL in non-citizen and citizen. And then if you turn it around, invert it, you can see that over the time, it is uh, the the non-citizen who actually led to an increase in the citizen. There was no increase in ESBL either. So it's a population mix that changed. It wasn't due to COVID. Um, and just to, to, to show you again a slide from ECDC that, that they say particular gram-negative bacteria is a problem in this population. So continue with the MDROs in my region during COVID. I can say that MRSA, there was absolutely no change. So look at the blue bars. There was no change over the time. It was all the same. It had been from before. So MRSA did not increase. Uh, I, 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 I couldn't get this, the data fast enough for Clostridium defeatsi or norovirus. I hadn't had the slide, uh, but I can trust me. There was no norovirus and no Clostridium difficile during COVID. Uh, uh, so there wasn't very little to show because there was hardly any case whatsoever because all the measures we took also had a clear influence on these two uh, pathogens. Uh, if we look at influenza, obviously the COVID uh, measurements had an, a, a great deal of influence against influenza. Uh, in the in the Netherlands, we, we say that if you have more than 60 cases of influenza-like symptoms reported to the GPs in GP offices over a pair 100,000 uh, inhabitants, uh, then we talk about an, uh, an epidemic of influenza. And you can see that for one month, they were nearly hit the, or just hit the 60, but of one month, one, uh, one week, it uh, hit the 60, but didn't went over it. And in 2021, obviously, we had zero influenza activity. And that is, is logical because that's what you achieve when you uh, use uh, the, the COVID measures. So, uh, by the way, that is also something while I'm concerned about uh, this season where we still have a lot of COVID and we'll see influenza. So what to expect in the, in the post-COVID uh, time? 
um, I believe that uh, we have to see how to stop the bad habits we develop during the COVID season. And you might think that hand hygiene is one of the things that improved and it was certainly uh, frequently used, but even there is a little point I'm going to point out later on. In general, I believe that uh, um, politics, uh, uh, the public and even healthcare administrators will forget about how useful IPC was, or they might feel that by now enough of the valuable resources were dumped into COVID measures and IPC in general, and I'm afraid that uh, that will not change uh, fast. So uh, they will develop a different mindset. They really want to do something else than infection control. There's a lot of what I call social impact. Support for infection control measures in the public might vanish. It will vanish, I believe, and this may impact healthcare workers' behavior. We, I think that we disregard how much if you are valued and if infection control is being placed as important all over to social media, uh, that has an influence on the behavior of our healthcare workers, and unfortunately, the other way around too. There are, oops, still discussions, I hope you still see that, still discussions about the use uh, uh, of, uh, of masks and the difference between region and countries, which are demotivating to all of us. Why that, if people can do it the other way, why can't we and happy to do it this way? And it's in general demotivating because it just gives the message of infection control doesn't know what to do. Uh, the priority in healthcare setting is changing to catch up with the previously postponed care. That's all our hospitals need and want to do. And there's a high number, and Bernard already mentioned it from his own company, the high number of sick healthcare workers leading to an extreme overload, which uh, workload, which generally is extremely bad for infection control. We know that too. So uh, they have too much to work, they don't get a rest. And really, this will hurt healthcare and healthcare workers for a pretty long time. We have too many people with burnouts, too many people that are sick, too many people who ask themselves why to even stay in healthcare, which will go into a, like a negative spiral uh, for, for the next years, which I'm convinced we will see. Um, how to stop the bad habits again? I think we need to create far more awareness. Now is the time to really train your healthcare workers, bringing them back, get rid of the bad habits, going back to how we have done it in the past. Address the problem among each other. We really need to work on a safety culture in our hospitals because infection control is not enough to go around and tell everyone what to do. Their colleagues have to train colleagues and let them know what they do wrong. So training, training, training is what is needed at the present time. There were other people who said the solution to every problem is another problem. A very smart thing from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe to say. Uh, there is another problem, a new problem coming at the same time. And you could say it's a great problem. It's a green, green healthcare or sustainable movement, which is really a good idea to do. But unfortunately, they are not there to replace less sustainable materials, but frequently changing the rules, ignoring existing guidelines. Sorry, typo, I just see it. So that is a problem, obviously. So, uh, so next to the post-COVID thing, we are in the beginning of the sustainability movement within healthcare, and we have to watch out that those involved do not change the rules, not without hard data, uh, but let's actually look into sustainable materials instead of that. With regard to hand hygiene, I saw that I mentioned that it must have been a good effect on hand hygiene. In my own country, the extremely frequent use of alcohol-based hand drops in tests and vaccination sheets of the public health services led to a report of our public health uh, um, uh, center on toxicity of ethanol. Because according to rules, people were disinfecting their hands 300 to 350 times a day. I never believe that anyone followed those rules uh, because that's impossible to do. But uh, they, they had a whole report and uh, occupational health came into picture, who now tells everyone about the risk of breast cancer, especially healthcare workers uh, become dubious about all alcohol-based hand drops, including those not based on ethanol. 
and this will ex have an impact on the compliance with hand hygiene. And uh, I, I, that's a terrible discussion that was started due to, in my occasion, wrong rules for hand hygiene in the vaccination streets in, in the Netherlands. Influenza, I already, I already said, while it was extremely low in the, in the last years, I expect for this year that there will uh, clearly an increase again. We will, see back, we will see influenza back. It will go over the epidemic uh, rate that is set at 60 per 100,000 in the Netherlands, not true influenza, but influenza-like uh, illness seen at the GP offices. And we will see it in combination with uh, with COVID, which will be a problem. So uh, my hope before uh, be that in the time before COVID will be regarded as just another influenza like illness. Uh, uh, I, I, I had oh, sorry again before COVID came, I had the hope that we would look further into uh, into influenza. Uh, the, the sick leave policy management and PPE use in addition to encourage an uptake of influenza vaccine because we have just published uh, this paper showing that uh, people were not leaving while they were having influenza-like symptoms or coming back to work too early and that hospitals do not allow their, their healthcare workers to really take the needed sick leave when they are uh, having influenza-like symptoms and COVID will have given away any chance of doing it now. If I would tell my hospital administrators to act on influenza-like symptoms at every given moment, uh, they will tell me, uh, forget about it. We need every single person there. So just today, we actually uh, will pass a, a, a rule that if the damage to healthcare by is, is higher by leaving a positive healthcare worker at home, then the chance of transmission and negative effect for the patients that positive healthcare workers might be allowed to work. So it will be discussed uh, on Thursday this week uh, for the Netherlands. Uh, and, and actually it is here. Um, I already said with the, the laboratory in Austria that is doing 500,000 tests a day, uh, uh, we will, by taking the, this, uh, the, the bulk work and low complex test uh, um, away from the normal laboratories who have an, who do in addition unpaid IPC service. Uh, uh, I think that there is an, 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 an imminent danger of uh, getting rid of those classical microbiology labs who have integrated services from prevention to to treatment advice, uh, and they will not have the money anymore to maybe do that if this kind of mass and bulk labs take away a lot of their work. So I, I believe, and they have a lot of pull because I found this when being asked about doing less, they immediately say, yeah, oh, then we have to fire 1,200 co-workers and obviously then somebody will think, let's give them more work. Predictions are difficult, especially about the future and that is given to many, many people, but I believe it was Niels Bohr who actually said it first. Uh, we had tried to build scenarios, and I think uh, that this is a way of looking at it. It, it could either be a common cold or influenza, like influenza plus, uh, or a continuous fight, or a worst case. I believe that most of us think that the worst case will not come unless uh, we have a new variant. Uh, there will be no work, worst case scenario anymore. But uh, I believe that we need to keep some of the good COVID measures and change our old ways to keep the scenarios up, to keep the push, the continuous fight scenario away and keep it at least for where we presently are, I believe, in, in a phase of uh, influenza plus. And I hope that over many, many, many years, uh, uh, we'll come into uh, the common cold kind of scenario with no changes. So what are the changes with regard to MDRO and my last uh, once molecular test capacity is freed, because that is now used for COVID mainly, we might start uh, a surveillance for VRE again and find far more of vancomycin resistant enterococci, because it was really not looked for for the last two years of two and a half years. MRSI should stay the same due to the same IPC improvement because everyone finds it important. So we'll always use the good measures. 
C. diff and norovirus will follow normal patterns, so we I expect to see more and I already see more again at the present time. C and e, CRE and other gram-negative multidrug resistant organisms will increase, but not due to COVID, but due to the increasing uh, refugee uh, relocation. So that was what I wanted to, to uh, share with you. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Andreas, for this uh, excellent lecture. Well, no wonder you, you're an you're a, um, engaged speaker in many occasions uh, because your, your context is very, very accurate and very, very uh, precise and your, your slides and your pictures are really uh, nicely supporting, supporting this. Um, I've got two um, questions from, from uh, listeners. And then I've questioned myself, and I will read these questions to you. Um, one of the guests is asking, how about frontline healthcare workers wear face shields when treating patients as a training tool to break their unconscious habit and protective measures blocking facial muscles membranes from droplets and their own fingers causing self-contamination? It has worked effectively for my family practice for the past two and a half years an effective, safe step for workers and patients. Yeah, if, if you, I'm not quite sure if we should continue to, to use uh, face shields. I mean, the, they are see-through, so you could say it does not create a barrier between you and the patient, but to a certain degree, it does. I mean, that's the idea uh, yeah. for, for its working. Um, I mean, if you, if you, I, I believe that we should be careful to only recommend uh, uh, any PPE in situation where it's needed. Uh, otherwise, we create an overuse. Uh, but if people do feel that uh, that their practice is improving, like uh, this colleague uh, obviously does, then you should continue. In general, I will only apply the measures that are really needed in the situation where. So I would go a splash shield like that only there when you expect splashing. And I think no one had ever thought about using it for influenza. And over a few years, I would hope that COVID is like influenza. Uh, if there's no new variant, that we, we should be able over over two, three years to be at that stage. And then uh, I don't think that people will use it. But if you feel unsafe, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I think that was a very good uh, response to this, to this input and to this question. The second question of one of our guests is, what is your explanation that in contrast to your data, CDC reported a significant increase in MDRO? Was there a change in AB consumption in the Netherlands? No, there was most certainly not a change in, in, in antibiotic consumption in the Netherlands. And if so, uh, uh, we are already the one, the Netherlands are the one having the lowest antibiotic consumption from, from all over Europe. So if we could change, the change could only be up, and up would mean clearly more MDROs. So uh, no, no change in antibiotic consumption in the Netherlands. But, um, does, does that explain, explain why the CDC reports uh, higher numbers in the MDRO? Uh, no, I think that's a general trend in the U.S. <laughs> okay. <good>. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is, and I have to admit that actually the latest trends for CRE in in the Netherlands are looking not say that that favorable anymore. They're still low and low, far lower okay. than okay. everywhere else, but it's also but going up, up again. which which I don't like. But I, as uh, I try to explain with my slides, I believe it has to do with. Uh, uh, with a lot of refugees entering the country and as you could see it in, in when I in the one slide that uh, the increase was only due to this population. But that was for the north. I actually have to say it was for the north of the Netherlands. It's a small region with very with with many refugees. Absolutely understood and absolutely clear. Uh, the next question is from Ariana. Uh, she says wearing gloves uh, for contact isolation very often reduces compliance with five moments of hand hygiene. How important is gloving in COVID patient care? If it's really a COVID, po COVID positive patient, I believe it, it's, uh, it has several, uh, several uh, plus points. And then we come back, it's funny, to the first point. Because if you wear gloves, the chances that you go into with your hands to your mucous membranes 
uh, is expected to be lower. And I'm not quite sure if it's true. And I just touched my nose <laughs> just to give you an example how easily it's done. I probably would not have done that with gloves. In general, I, I fully understand uh, Ayana because uh, uh, I think that we overuse gloves, qu gloves quite a bit. And with good hand hygiene, that wouldn't be necessary at the right moment. So, but on a COVID positive patients, we still do and, and use them mainly because we say that uh, that it will prevent people from touching their own mucous membranes. Thank you very much for answering this one. Um, I have two, two um, issues or two um, thoughts of your presentation that really scared me. And the, the most scary one definitely is that the healthcare workers are exhausted. Uh, because this is something that that um, that has an impact on the entire healthcare system in, in our in our country. Uh, do you see uh, differences in different countries and nations, or is that the situation that 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 you observe everywhere? No, I, I can. Middle Europe, Southern Europe. Yeah. No, I, I wish I could give you an answer to that one, and I would love to have the data. I know it from uh, from from parts in Germany where uh, I still have friends uh, that work and tell me about it, and I know it from all over the Netherlands. It's a general problem. I cannot believe that it's not the same in in different countries. But if I if I look at the the, the even at this present point, the with the postponed care is in, increasing because. We cannot achieve 100% of the care that we should do because we have too many sick and burned out healthcare workers. Uh, we have people leaving uh, healthcare uh, to do other jobs because they getting there's so much pressure, especially on our nurses, uh, that uh, we really have to rethink what we want to do uh, and and how to to arrange it in a better way. Because if we continue doing what we do now, push for more. Uh, we'll be getting in trouble. Yeah, I'm I'm really worried about that. And with regard to infection yeah, control, too. when you're so stressed, then infection control is the last thing on your mind. Unfortunately, yes. And and uh, I can just say that for Austria, we have a similar problem. And right now, politicians uh, start at least have started to to establish initiatives to make the job of the healthcare workers and the nurses more attractive, win more people for the education, because also the, the schools, uh, the educations of, of, of healthcare workers are half empty, and we are definitely lacking this, this type of, of, of personnel. And at the same time, some of them are sick with COVID and some of them are exhausted. So in principle, this is this is something that, that is really scary. And, and uh, I really have to say, this is something that, that should be definitely addressed by, by all our politician, politicians in all kinds. Yeah. We have two. We have two more questions here for you. Um, another guest uh, says it is interesting that Netherlands does not have a problem with multi drug resistance at Sedinobacter, but ESBL. Uh, yeah, maybe it is. Be, 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 with Sedinobacter was not uh, an, an like like an endemic problem. It's coming from outside. Uh, we we treat asthma patients like we do with with uh, with MRSA. Uh, everyone coming from outside is 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 being checked for for not only MRSA but for all multi drug resistant organisms. Staying in isolation, uh, we had a few outbreaks of asthma that were kept at 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 range in the end. So it's it's not really our main problem. And you might have seen papers from the Netherlands on how we treat uh, water, water sources and get rid of them in many, many hospitals, uh, which are also, in my opinion, a great source for uh, not only acetamide to back up pseudomonas, but also for other gram negative MDROs. Uh, and I see that that Will is continuing the the reasoning while while to wear the the. Yeah, the, you, the, <laughs> the it, it's a, it's a good point. It's, it's exactly obviously you will prevent. not do that, but if you use yeah gloves or a shield. Uh, I think people should use what they feel safe with, feel welcome with, and how you can approach your patient the best. But I will try to reduce the use of uh, PPE to situation where it's strictly needed. Uh, uh, that That's my personal opinion. Yeah, and I think this is a good response to what Will uh, wrote in, in his last uh, comment. Um, 
before we let you go, one one last question. This is also a big concern to me, and I think to to all of us, um, the overuse of um, alcohol-based hand rubs um, puts puts alcohol uh, in the suspect of of being cancerogenic or what whatsoever. I mean, if that really gets into the news, then then we have a very very difficult situation uh, because uh, a minor disadvantage if you use it too often might uh, jeopardize the, the the positive effect that that has been achieved in the last twenty five years with alcohol. Uh, anything that we can do against this, or how do you how do you see? Yeah, that? we 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 have to get better data because what I mentioned now in the Netherlands is ongoing on on one uh, one report of our public health services. Uh, uh, which which is a terrible model. I, we, we will publish on that uh, very very soon. Uh, they they have they have done accumulate worst case scenario on worst case scenario on worst case scenario and so on. So people were always using three milliliters of hand alcohol for for one minute in a in an. Uh, in an unventilated room of one by one square meter, yeah, but then you uh, get drunk, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and so on and so on. And I think, of course, we we have to protect healthcare workers. But uh, number one, the number one alcohol hand drop in my own country is is not on ethanol base. Uh, it's that's an alternative right. that's being used, especially used for 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 viruses in many cases. Um, so. And no one. I mean, if you're, you you need to you do, do if you eat fruit, you reach that too. So we should stop eating fruit too. Uh, we should stop drinking. And I'm afraid I'm I'm that every evening I'm getting far more uh, ethanol into my blood than I will ever do with hand rubbing. Uh, there is research from outside the Netherlands that show that you cannot reach any harmful borders with alcohol. So. Uh, and, and, and think about perfumes and everything else. Strangely enough, the Dutch and the French picked it up. It's not even passed in the European law. It was a suggestion, still passing. It was first started in 2017. And, and now due to this one stupid, uh, it's, I'm getting nearly emotional under this, stupid research, everyone is making like a major thing about it. Uh, I believe, and WHO believes there, and, and I believe CDC too, we can continue to just use it safely. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. And, and being a chemist by training, we had much harsher chemicals that we were confronted with. Um, the point is, and I re remember uh, one of the lectures, uh, I think it was Alexander Bert, Bert, Petra, uh, at the last ICPIC, she was, she was talking about fake news. And uh, Peters, yeah, Alexandra Peters, she was talking about fake news and fake news spread much faster than, than uh, yeah. facts. And uh, she gave the example of this one publication that alcohol lost its activity. And when they traced it back, they found out that it was a, um, a test using 23% alcohol instead of 75% equus alcohol. And, and it was very difficult to, 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 to catch it and to, to, to come back. And, and all the newspapers picked it up and said, okay, alcohol lost its activity. Alcohol is not active anymore. And this fake news situation could also happen here. Alcohol is causing cancer. If that is in, in, in our top newspapers, if that is written in built, then we have a problem. Yeah, someone just... Uh posted uh, I believe it's it's uh, um, a paper from from DDA or or uh, Axel Kramer is the first also I mean uh, but yeah. there is a post on the in the thing and people that must be the that paper in in uh, in uh, Eric uh, it, it's a good one to read telling you why it's so indispensable and needed uh, but there must be there must be more publications uh, like this coming to really influence politicians to uh, not finalize this proposal. Absolutely. Okay. Um, there is one article, antimicrobial resistant infection control, that was put into the into the chat. And Will Sawyer would be very interested to get in touch with you, Andreas. So um, he's he's absolutely free to to contact you um, through, through all the uh, media. Um, I think with this, uh, I would like to close this session. It was extremely exciting to listen to you and also to discuss with you the different the different issues. 
And uh, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for the discussion. And we will let you go because you have another couple of meetings and a long tr trip to go today. And we hope to be in touch again soon. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting, everyone. And yeah, sorry that thank I you have to leave. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Goodbye. So as a second speaker, I would like to invite Emesha Shilagi to unmute herself. Uh, Hello, Emeshi, good to see you. Hello, Bernard, good to see you and hello to everyone. How are you? I mean, how is life? Well, not easier <laughs> than last year. And um, however, I feel very privileged that you invited me for this presentation. As I told you before, I was unable to prepare for with the presentation because I have a, also a lot of operative uh, obligations. I would just um, um, had time to start uh, thinking, uh, to collect my thinkings and my experiences in these three year, years and to share with is, you. That is very, very appreciated because before you start, I would like to introduce you officially. Uh, I also assume that most people will know you because you're well known in the community and you have been uh, talking at the Semmelweis um, conferences a couple of times. Uh, I remember that the last time we spoke, it was the, the virtual Samuelweiss conference a year and a half ago. And exactly. that, was in the, that was in the middle of the lockdown. And uh, when I when I asked you, how, how are you back then? You said exhausted. And that was yeah. a very good description for the time <laughs> a, a year and a half ago. Well, as, as you all know, um, Emeche is an anesthesiologist and intensive care physician, and she worked as a physician for a couple of years. Um, 20, 2001, she joined the National Center of Epidemiology and she was the, the leading hospital epidemiologist from then on. Then she moved on to the chief medical officer office in Budapest. And um, in 2018, she switched again and she became medical director um, and the infection control lead at the Peter Fai Hospital in Budapest. And for those of you who don't know that, this is one of the biggest hospitals in Hungary with over 1,200 beds. So quite a challenge in these times, I have to say. And um, she 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 um, offered us to speak about the impact of COVID-19 on HAI prevalences uh, in MDRO and BSI, the challenges and the lessons learned after the two, two and a half years that we were facing the pandemic now. So we are listening to you, Emische. Thank you, and um, sorry again for not having some slides. It would have been much easier to show in figures, but I would like to tell you, and maybe you can notice and uh, remember easier some figures that I will talk about. First of all, I would like to join a bit what Andreas was telling, that there was there has been an extreme workload of all of our healthcare workers all over the world, I think, what I, I have experienced here closely from all my colleagues, not only working in clinical fields and especially ICU, but also in infection control. We have been also extremely overloaded and we were very sorry that we are unable to perform um, a good job, you know, because there was mostly firefighting and not the routine um, proper job that I'm satisfied in the evening when I went home that I have done uh, my best to prevent infections or to control infections. And it couldn't be the case because it was there were so many COVID cases from one side and so many other healthcare associated infections on the other side that uh, uh, we were always, you know, there was not uh, real-time data for intervention. We always were running about our data and then also interpretation and intervention sometimes uh, occurred lately. So this is a confession that I think that we have all with all of us to face because we didn't have any extra personnel for these three or four times extra load of work, including COVID and including mm -hmm. increased healthcare associated infections. Um, I would like, you know, what we are doing routinely as a basic, we are monitoring um, bloodstream infections uh, hospital-wide 
and uh, we are doing an active uh, unit-based surveillance in our ICU, so we are collecting also central lines, uh, data about central lines. And um, as an infection control intervention, we introduced in 1918 and 19, uh, 2019 and 20, 2019 and 2020, 20 before COVID, uh, care bundle to, for prevention of central line associated infections. And uh, we had beautiful previously results that in one year from 2018 to 19, we had a reduction of 20% of our central line associated blood stream infections. And then after COVID ca came, uh, we again monitored these uh, rates of central line blood uh, associated blood stream infections. And uh, we analyze it at least half yearly. And I have to confess that uh, during the base of COVID, these rates of central line associated blood stream infections increased um, two or three or even more than three times than the uh, rates before COVID. So the fact that we had to expand our ICU capacity more than double or triple our beds, but without additional trained staff, it, we could show that uh, overloaded personnel and not properly uh, trained personnel, because uh, we, we had beds to expand and we had respirators, but not trained personnel from in a short time. Um, um, and then a uh, lack of such an infection control presence and observation and compliance measurement um, we have figures that led to uh, probably non-compliance with, uh, with uh, bundle elements and uh, including hand hygiene. So we can sh we show, to, according to our results, that unfortunately it had a great impact on central and associated blasphemy infection with an increase of um, um, in the heart in the, the most severe wave, and it was the third one in the spring 2021, uh, more than three times than in the baseline before COVID. So that is, imp is important and important data that I can share with you. Um, then when we tried to analyze these uh, causes behind, then uh, we saw that there is a um, shortage of personnel, of course, not that trained personnel. And we, when we made observation and studied, we saw a non-compliance uh, with bundled elements. And especially this double gloving made a safe, say, uh, um, uh, uh, like a safety feeling for healthcare workers. And then it decreased a lot compliance with hand hygiene and even gloves changing sometimes. So they didn't feel that these gloves are very contaminated. And uh, sometimes they manipulated even central lines without even changing or disinfecting gloves. So as Andrea said, a lot of bans and uh, rules which, which were forbidden before uh, changing um, or disinfecting gloves or double gloving or um, re-disinfecting or re-sterilizing single um, personal protective equipment or other equipment uh, contributed to, to all this um, increase in, in uh, healthcare associated infections beside, for ICU COVID patients. So that's what I wanted to point to, to figure out um, as a priority. And then maybe you would have some comments on it. And we also monitor uh, hospital-wide and ICU-wide infections caused by, so hospital infections caused by um, um, MDRI, oh, uh, MRSA, VRA, ESBL, uh, Enterobacterales, and we did not see any increase in, uh, even a decrease during COVID. We don't have the real explanation behind it, but um, uh, what is important to know that there was no increase in our hospital in antibiotic consumption uh, due to the fact that COVID infections are viral infections. Uh, uh, so antibiotics were used only um, in case of proper indication, um, but we did not observe an increase in um, infections caused by multidrug resistance organisms. 
So that's what I wanted to share with you shortly. And I just made a very short literature research and I uh, uh, found some articles which also published an increase in bloodstream infections during COVID and also having a similar explanation behind it. Thank you. If you thank, have any comments or... Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much, Emishe. I just had to unmute myself. Um, and this also sounds scary. I mean, a two to three fold increase in bloodstream infections is is not nothing. This is this is quite dramatic. Um, do, do, can, do, did you see uh, different types of, of BSI clusters uh, amongst the COVID-19 ICU patients? Yeah, unfortunately, we saw also clusters, but as I told you before, sometimes a bit too late and we did not know if there were clusters because we could not identify anymore if there was a link in space and time before those mm -hmm. patients just at the end of maybe a month or or at the end of three or two months. But what we did not have before that within a year, uh, we had uh, maybe nine places of Pseudomonas ruginosa, not multidrug resistance, but anyway, the number was very high. So it, yeah. was, a, it was a cluster for sure. Then we had um, eight uh, cases of enterococci, then Seracia marsistans, six cases, Staph aureus, um, five cases, then Eclipsia lapneumonia, six cases. So within a year, it was much, much higher, and it might be that it might have been relations in between. What we know that we uh, made also environmental samples and um, we found that there was another, we identified um, a mistake in infection control practices, a multi-dial um, uh, multi use, which was previously forbidden, but it was done for commodity let's say reasons, and it was contaminated. So once we found really a source of uh, two or three cases of uh, Lipsiella bloodstream infection. In other cases, we did not found, but we did not have, you know, the chance to, to identify any uh, sources of infections or links between the cases. But anyway, as the number of cases mm -hmm. and the pathogens, uh, we could identify a cluster within a, within a year. So a, a three times or more than mm -hmm. three times higher number, of course, that generates more and more pathogens also. And, and interestingly, uh, even among yeah. uh, blossom infections, we hardly had any um, uh, blossom infections caused by multidrug resistant organisms. Those were only single cases and in a whole year only four cases from, for example, 70 mm -hmm. uh, bloodstream infections. Just to have, you know, a, a, um, a view uh, um, how it shows. That's, that's interesting. Do you have an explanation for this ratio? Why you didn't have too many MDROs? Uh, well, for the low rate of multidrug resistance organisms, I don't really have for the high rates of blood stream infections, I think, and we, we have uh, seen at our direct observational audits that uh, there were uh, disruptions in infection control of the bundle of the CVC bundle care, full infection, lock of uh, hand disinfection, and new uh, sterile glass when manipulation central venous catheters, or lock of disinfection of hops at manipulation, or maybe dressings were not properly uh, assessed daily and changed properly. But I think that hub manipulation without disinfection and manipulation of catheters without hand disinfection or, or clean, at least disinfectant gloves, um, conducted to this um, situation. And all, most of these um, pathogens were gram-negative pathogens, which mm -hmm. are which could be found maybe in the sinks and the environment. Yeah. So, in case of lack of hand disinfection or hub disinfection introduction to the into the bloodstream, it could happen easily. 
thank, thank you for this. This, this, is, a, this is definitely a, a good hypothesis and an explanation. Um, now that COVID is leaning back a little bit and now that uh, not too many patients are ending up at the ICU anymore, do you see this situation to reverse again or is, are these numbers still so high? Now it's okay. I couldn't hear you for a few moments, but now um, I couldn't hear, okay, hear then your I will, I will. I will repeat my questions. Uh, now that COVID is leaning back a little bit, and now that not so many patients are in the ICUs, COVID patients are in the ICUs anymore, do you see this trend to revert? Do you see an improvement of these uh, PSI infections again, or is it still very high? Uh, we see a reverse and we are uh, strongly monitoring and we uh, went back to our previously um, direct observational um, uh, process measurement and we are measuring again compliance to center venous uh, line uh, care bundle elements and we are doing a lot of education 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 and trying to make them forget bad habits and not universal gloving and we have uh, made be forbidden uh, or banned uh, double gloving which is a uh, high risk but we couldn't do it during covid because it it made it made a for safety but now uh, it's forbidden double gloving and strict hand hygiene and uh, proper pp use always have disinfection so audit of uh, care bundle uh, seems that works and uh, education uh, directed education on the identified uh, uh, weak points and now situation is going back to the normal we have also a few months of zero bsi rates now oh that's 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 amazing. That's that's a big achievement after this after this difficult time, and and uh, so you you're in full alignment with Andreas Foss. Andreas also said training, training, training to get rid of these bad habits and get back to a good standard of compliance. So this is probably uh, the most yeah. important issue. Uh, the issue that, that both of you report, Andreas and you, is the exhausted personnel, uh, yeah. the, the, the lack of, of uh, healthcare workers, and this is something that probably cannot be changed easily. What are you doing in Budapest or what are you doing in your hospital to handle this situation? Oh, it's a very hard situation. Uh, we are advertising, we hardly can find uh, personnel. It's very, very difficult, really. It's very, very difficult. Sometimes we have to hire or to get locum personnel, which is again a patient safety, um, you know, uh, risk, special risk, yeah. but uh, sometimes Definitely. we really can't have uh, our own workers. But again, the idea, Andrea said, it's very good that we have to start to uh, advertise this uh, healthcare, to be a healthcare worker at school, or you said that, and it's a very good point, to make it interesting, uh, to make it uh, 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 one of, to make it worthy, you know, to put it on a high uh, level, uh, at, at the whole society to be somebody proud to work in healthcare because otherwise it doesn't work. It's very hard physically, psychologically. Uh, so especially now, especially now it's a hard work to work to have enough personnel because those who still remained are just, uh, uh, again, just uh, overloaded, still overloaded. Yeah, no, but I totally agree. We have to uh, to increase the reputation of the job, yeah. and everybody has to be aware how important this job is and what these people are doing for our society. And hopefully, we will yeah. win more young people to 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 choose this as a as a career path. And um, if we if we will not succeed with this, we will see difficult times. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Fully agree. Um, Emisha, there is a, uh, a question of Biljana from, from, from Belgrade. Um, she asks, did your clinicians change anything in the procedure of CVC placement? Did these numbers increase in some period of time so we can think about outbreak? 
Well, I think um, that during COVID, uh, several um, rules um, were not respected, including a maximal barrier uh, at um, puncture, so uh, maximal sterile barrier used at sterile at uh, the puncture. And as I told you, uh, hub disinfection and hand disinfection. This was during COVID period, and that what could cause to to clusters, and um, when we have um, an, a really outbreak, outbreak that was when we had a, a contaminated um, uh, vial of medicines, which was misused, and it was contaminated, and we found it in uh, three uh, patients' uh, uh, hemoculture. So that was documented. The others, we have the hypothesis, and we don't know really exactly whether they were in the same room or in the same time, because there was no possibility to retrospectively analyze it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think this is a good response to Biliana's uh, question. Uh, I, I believe that Biliana will face very similar problems in her hospital, and she uh, told us a little bit about this uh, last time. It's also one of the bigger hospitals uh, in this in these regions, and and definitely not easy to 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 keep track of all the all the situations and all the outbreaks and handling the the exhausted stuff issue in in in, in big places like that. Good. So. Um, Thank you very much, Emily, for joining us. And Sheng, thank you very much for sharing this experience, first-hand experience from a big hospital in the COVID time uh, regarding ICU patients, blood screen infections, all of that. And we hope that we can be in touch uh, again in one of the next lectures or with one of the next conferences. Thank you, too, and I hope the same. Goodbye. Goodbye, Emily. Goodbye. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Jakub Kozak to you, and I would like to ask Jakub to unmute himself and to show up at, in front of the in front of the camera. Yeah, there he is. Hello, Jakub. Hello. Good, good to see you, um, and the pleasure to have you here. Um, for those of you who don't uh, know Jakub, Jakub is um, from the industry. He's not from a hospital. And he's not from a big multinational slow company, but he's from the CEO and the co-founder of Datelow. This is the parent company of Heidi. Um, it's a highly not innovative Czech startup company dealing with um, AI algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithms to protect patients from unnecessary infections. Jakub holds a master degree in mathematical modeling in physics from the Karlova University in Prague. Um, he had several roles as a consultant and a researcher in, in the IT field, and then he started Datelow as a CEO and co-founder. And we are all very interested, Jakub, to listen to you. What can Heidi doing, do for us and what are you doing at, at, your, at your company? Jakub, please. Okay. Uh, hello to everyone. Thank you, Bernard, for, for a great introduction. Uh, and I'm, I'm really happy that I can present the results. Uh, of uh, how we are collaborating with hospitals and how we are helping them to with uh, the surveillance of, of uh, healthcare associated infections. So as, as Bernard already said, I'm, I'm the co-founder and CEO of the company Datlove. We are a, a company based in Prague in Czech Republic, and we are helping hospitals to uh, leverage the power of data hidden in their hospital information systems and our flagship product is currently called Heidi, which helps hospitals with the automation of surveillance of, of uh, hospital-acquired infections. And uh, so I will tell you a bit of how automation can help, and I believe this will kind of extend the last uh, Semmelweis talk that was kind of uh, focused on, on, uh, on the surveillance of, of healthcare-associated infections. So first of all, uh, let me briefly go to through through the surveillance types that 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 are being done in hospitals that we have uh, talked so far because there are still a big differences between the healthcare facilities in in doing surveillance of healthcare associated infections ranging from passive to uh, really active surveillance and I have 
place them in, in a chart uh, that summarizes how much effort you need to uh, put into the types of surveillance and what kind of quali output quality you can expect from them. So this starts from the passive surveillance where physicians report uh, the healthcare associated infections when they occur in their departments. This is for the infection prevention teams, the, the easiest way to go because they expect the data to come from the departments. So they don't need to put a lot of effort into collecting this kind of data. But usually the, uh, the quality of the output is very low. Uh, the number or incidence of these inf infections is usually below 1%, which does not reflect the reality. So then there are hospitals that are focusing more on active surveillance and they're doing active manual surveillance based on microbiology results. This would be, in my opinion, some kind of a gold standard in, in the industry that I have seen in Czech Republic, Slovakia, Austria and Germany doing surveillance based on the results of microbiology results. This is mu much more effort than the passive surveillance, but delivers much better data. But, but some of the people don't rely only on microbiology and start working also with, with clinical notes and, and do some research or, or checks, discharge summaries, for example, from ICUs or other specific types of departments, which leads to even higher effort, but also in higher output quality. But this active manual surveillance focused also on clinical notes usually takes almost like tens of hours per week to get some results. And then there is a, a thing like automation or data analysis that offers the potential of uh, getting better data with, with lower effort. And this is actually based on this. This chart is like an illustrative chart, but it's based on the results that we have with Heidi. So I will show you how the automation can give you or provide you with better output quality with lower effort needed and help you to, to, to change the work that you do in infection prevention. So as I said, like, like this, this results, the, the results that I will present are, are are delivered by our software called Heidi, which is based on, on artificial intelligence and advanced data analytics, and that can automatically detect all major types of healthcare associated infections based on the electronic health records that are stored in your hospital information systems. I will, I will dive a bit deeper into this uh, a couple slides later. Uh, it works at all departments, so it helps you to do the hospital-wide surveillance, which is not concentrated only on specific departments. And because it can, it also reads uh, unstructured clinical notes to detect symptoms and diagnoses, it currently speaks Czech, Slovak, German, and English. We have successfully deployed Heidi in, in 18 hospitals where, where it is now fully operational. Uh, ranging from hospitals smaller with, I don't know, 300 beds, 200 beds, up to university hospitals with 1,200 beds. The, the implementations are running in Czechia, Slovakia, and Austria. So, so we have a, quite a wide range of experience from, from different countries and different hospital sizes. And to, to give you a better overview, like in total, Heidi takes care for about eight and a half thousand of bets in total and processes data about, I don't know, almost 400,000 inpatients annually. So the most of the customers are now in, in Czech Republic, but we're, we're expanding and also to Germany, and et cetera. So how does it work? So I already said that it detects automatically potential healthcare associated infections. So the important thing is, uh, automatically detects and potential. So it goes through all the types of information that are stored in the hospital information system in an electronic form. So it is important to have at least partial documentation in electronic form. And Heidi then scans on a continuous basis all admission notes, daily progress notes, nursing documentation, medication and consultations, lab results, etc. to get the key information that might be relevant for 
detecting a potential healthcare associated infection. So it uses something that's called natural language processing, uh, a technology that can extract information from free text written by physicians and nurses to detect, as you can see, for example, fever in different types of texts for pain in the chest or problems with urination can uh, say that this is an information in a negative context that shouldn't be used. So can distinguish between abbreviations, etc. So this is kind of a uh, heart of, of Heidi, this analysis that picks the information from, from different sources, puts it into a, we call it a timeline of clinical events, and based on this information, delivers automatically updated list of potential HAIs. So you, as infection prevention specialist, get a list of like filtered patients with potential HAI on a continuous basis. And then it is up to you to just to validate these infections and say whether this is or this isn't a, a real healthcare associated infection. So the final a decision always rely on the experts from hospital hygiene and epidemiology. Based on this validated infections, it automatically creates reports and statistics um, of, of these validated cases, which also saves a lot of time and, and gives you a, an instant overview of the situation in the hospital. And as a side effect, it also analyzes, for example, microbiology results and, and provides uh, information on resistance patterns of different pathogens, so you can use it for antibiotic stewardship, et cetera. So this was like a theory to, to show you a bit, this is how it looks in, in the software when, when there is a potential HAI reported. Uh, I know there is not time for, for live demo right now, but you know, uh, there, is a, there is the information about the patient extracted it off, uh, from, from, the, from the electronic health records in the, in the middle. And on the right hand side, there's automatically pre-filled uh, form with the potential with the potential uh, HAI. So this is something that the hospitals has been using. And, and what are the what are the results? So that the recent results that, that we that we have are, are are the following. So what's the difference between the manual versus semi-automated uh, semi-automated uh, surveillance? So this is these are the results from a hospital with more than 400 beds, uh, which is like typical uh, local hospital in, in Czech Republic. And they have been, they, they were doing a, a surveillance uh, based on microbiology results. So something as what, what I call the gold standard in, in, in Czech Republic. And they, they had their own statistics and then they started using Heidi in, in July 21. So they did a comparison of, of the year 2019 with with uh, with uh, uh, with the first year of using Heidi, which is I know it's kind of a it's kind of affected by the COVID situation, but nevertheless, uh, this was recalculated to the HAIs per hundred thousand care days, and and the and the result is that the the overall incidence uh, increased by 82 percent. So the numbers uh, of detected cases increased by 82%, and especially in some cases, it was more than uh, double the, the number. Uh, the, the, some of the reasons are that, you know, Heidi can find also HS that are not confirmed with microbiology results. This is this one thing. And also surgical site infections that occur after discharge in outpatient settings. So Heidi also checks uh, uh, the outpatient checks uh, after after surgery when when the patient comes back to a to a hospital. So this is one thing. They, I would say usually or, or always so far, Heidi delivered higher incidence or helped hospital to detect more cases than than with the manual setting. Uh, so I said like Heidi utilizes analysis of free text uh, clinical notes. So if so is it really worth doing it? I, I already said something about it. So this is a statistics of how many pneumonias were not confirmed microbiology with microbiology results and how many of them were confirmed. So uh, you can see, for example, here that almost 
three three quarters, seventy five percent of of uh, of pneumonias, HAI pneumonias, were not confirmed microbiology results. So you couldn't find them with just doing the surveillance based on the microbiology results. Uh, a slightly lower incidence of SSIs, just thirty percent or more than thirty percent, were not confirmed with microbiology results. So this is something that Heidi can help with, uh, detecting uh, cases that are not confirmed microbiology. So it seems like you, you get more cases and something like that. So does it really save time or how does it help? So actually, Heidi helped to reduce the time needed for, for data collection, which means uh, detecting the cases and uh, and then, uh, you know, preparing statistics, et cetera. This is another hospital with, with more than 500 beds, slightly, slightly larger than the previous one, where they also did the, the check or, or surveillance based on microbiology results. And the time spent on, on the data collection, uh, just on the data collection, uh, decreased by 50% from, from about 40 hours to about 20 hours per month. Uh, which is kind of a significant uh, decrease of time that you can invest in in other uh, in other activities than than going through patient charts and, and preparing Excel spreadsheets. And uh, maybe the last thing uh, about the the results is that about the real time data because Heidi goes through the data on a continuous basis, so it scans electronic health records continuously. It helps you to detect the cases when they are happening. Uh, this is something that that's not really uh, happening in the hospitals when they do the manual surveillance. They they usually lag uh, the the detection of the cases by a couple of weeks. Once the patient is discharged, then there is some you know time, and and then they start you know looking at the patient, and they get data. I don't know a month later after the patient's already gone. But if you have this in, in a real time, so you, you get the, the update, you know what, every morning you can check the new, new patients, you can talk to the physicians at the departments directly, especially when, when the cases are serious, and increase the awareness of the problem of HAIs, which means like they, they know they should, they should follow the, the preventive measures and they they realize that you know somebody is watching, and it's uh it it's a real problem that should be uh that should be addressed. So all this deployment of automation and and time savings and and uh you know prepared statistics automatically means that there is like a shift in 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 the work of of infection prevention teams. Because they don't need to do, they don't need to invest that much into data collection and, and sorting and, and spreadsheet preparing. And they're working more on the interpretation of, of the delivered information and communicating them to, to, the, to the specialists or, or healthcare professionals working in the departments, which I think is, is the most important thing uh, for, for the infection prevention team to, to interpret the data and communicated because this is something that that software or technology cannot do for you to to you know work with the people it can help you with with manual task automation can help you you know to get insights on on where to focus your uh your work but what it cannot help you how to you know tell tell it to surgeons how to tell it to internal medicine specialists etc so this is something what happens when you deploy automation you shift a bit more into, into the field work and into the co communication. So I, I think uh, like the technology right now it, it's, it's really ready to help hospitals with, with the different tasks. Heidi is, is one example of how you can get the value out of the data that's already being uh, saved in hospital information systems and that can really uh you know improve the quality of, of care in the hospitals we received like a very positive feedback this is one of the first users of our app uh and and they always say like like it's 
so great to have the data and they can concentrate on, on what they really want to do. So the real infection prevention. And uh, I always enjoy talking to people in, in hospitals that, that where I can see that we really uh, help them uh, to like, deliver better care for, for patients. So thank you again for, for the opportunity. And if you have any questions, be happy to thank answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jakub. Of course, we have a couple of questions. Um, two questions are already popped up in, in, in the chat. One question is, how long does it take to, to uh, implement the Heidi software? What is the typical timeline for that? Uh-huh. OK. Uh, so it's usually it takes uh, like three months to implement in, in, a, in, a, in a, like a regular hospital to be to be very specific. But of course, it depends on the software that, that Heidi takes the data from. So, so about the hospital information system, for example, in Czech Republic, we already have like a standardized interface, uh, which allows us to connect to most of the uh, vendors. Uh, we, we have done this also in Austria now, so we're working on this. So, so I would say like a standard time is three months, but it depends on the IT, uh, mostly on the IT capabilities of the hospital. And typically, uh, the system then screens the data on the hospital server, and in the morning, the, the hospital epidemiologist gets such suggestions which patient might be affected. Then he can go yes. after these patients. Okay. Amazing, amazing, amazing. There is another uh, question. Those pneumonia cases, were they detected from patient records, nurses, or physicians' texts, or from X-ray texts? Mm -hmm. Uh, so Heidi works with all of these texts that were described. So, so it, it works, uh, with physicians, texts, uh, nurses, texts, and also like the radiologist descriptions. It does not work directly with the images, but it works with the descriptions. So when there is an information about, you know, the radiologist says there is an infiltrates in lungs <clears throat> or something, Heidi detects this as, as a symptom of of potential pneumonia and uses it and, and puts it into the timeline of, of a patient and then, you know, adds more information from 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 the nursing docs at, at, as well as, as the physician stuff. Um, fully, fully understood. Um, is the system um, system that has an, an algorithm implemented that is trained as the system goes along? Will the system become better or is that always at the same level? Uh, so we are we are working, uh, you know, we're still improving it. I, I think it's never going to be perfect. So uh, so we're we're always working on getting better. So once the physicians or, or the epidemiologists uh, confirm or reject the cases, so so we take the feedback and, and run uh, and improve the models based based on the feedback as well. So uh, this is something that's that's being continuously improved and is part of I mean, since we have a couple of, of uh, epidemiologists and also medical directors of, of hospitals on, on online, uh, what would be the cost for a typical hospital if they install this, this software? Uh, so we, uh, so the system is, is priced as a service, basically. Uh, it means like, like there is an implementation costs for for setting it up in, in a hospital this for for the work for for the people for for, you know, getting everything up up and running with with training included etc so this is one part and then there is like a monthly fee <coughs> based for for the license uh, maintenance uh, upgrades etc uh, that depends on the size of the hospital mostly so it's it's always like an individ mostly like individual price based based on, on on the hospital and and also on the value that it can bring in a certain region so um, we have put your um, link to the to the chat. So when somebody is really interested, uh, you can definitely contact uh, Jakub directly and ask for a quote or how much the implementation would cost. And yeah. Jakub, Jakub nicely displayed in which language it is is available, and maybe you will ex extend your your language portfolio over time and also offer yeah. in Bulgarian, yeah. in Romanian, in Polish, in whatsoever language. Yes, sure. We are we're ready to, you know, uh, show uh, 
a demo of the app uh, online or uh you know it's uh it's it's not a big deal we do it all the time so if anybody is interested you know just drop us an email or there is a form on the website and, and we'll get back to you and and do an online demo or on site <clears throat> fantastic the the link is the link is in in the email um Iliana from from belgrade is asking when you start with heidi did the incidence rates increase or decrease when you start working with Heidi, the incidence always increases. Yeah, uh, because you know there. Yeah. yeah, because uh, you know, like uh, it's not possible to track all the cases manually unless you invest, uh, you know, really large amounts of work in that, and nobody is doing it. It's I think it's impossible. So so it always increases at least by tens of percent. So I I think the. Yeah, like 60, 70 percent is like a minimum that, that we have, you know, we, we, we've seen from the passive surveillance, they were at like on one percent uh, and, and we helped them to get over five percent. So it was like a big, uh, big leap forward. And, and, you know, it's always like a question. Yeah, what about the management? What will they say? You know, like, is, is it right? Is it wrong? But I think it's it's getting on the right path that everybody understands that, you know, Getting the right data will help us to be better, and and not just you know getting the wrong PR. Absolutely. One last question from my side: When did you found the company? How long are you on the road already? Uh, so we started with Heidi in twenty seventeen. Uh, okay, five years. So mm -hmm. so we're like five years with with Heidi. Uh, yeah, and then you know we kind of released it for first commercial use in 2019 then we're kind of stopped or slowed down by covid because you know as infection prevention teams were busy with other stuff uh but now it seems uh like everybody it's just uh fantastic no, we we keep our fingers crossed that you that you can build the company successfully and thank you very, very much for this presentation and explanation what you can do with already existing data in a hospital to identify cases earlier on and, and get better transparency in, in your in your uh, hospital. The time is now at the end. Uh, I would like to thank you, Jakub, and also Emesche and Andreas, of course, for giving your presentations and, and for, your, for your lectures. Um, I would also like to thank all the listeners that stayed with us, uh, take the knowledge, look into, into the presentations, spread the information, spread the word, what you have heard here. Um, thanks to my technical team who made it possible to, to run this, this conference. Thanks to our sponsors. And please do not forget to give us feedback on, on, this, on this conference. We always like to collect feedback, not only what was good and what was not so good, but also ideas what we could uh, bring as a, as a topic, good speakers. We always uh, rely on recommendations of our friends in the in the community. Um, we hope to see you at the next lecture. This will be early early next year. We will um, in, in, in due time let you know who is going to speak about what and when. Uh, for this year, it will be the last lecture. Christmas is coming closer. Everybody's very busy. I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to squeeze in another Semmelweis talk, but we will meet again definitely in January next year and continue this series of, of very successful uh, talks and listening to, to fantastic speakers, people from the hospital, speaker, people from the practice, people talking about real, real life cases, sharing experience, exchanging experience, encouraging other people to, to follow the example. And I think this is also why we are doing this, uh, this uh, conference. So thanks a lot. This Semmelweis talk is finished. Uh, best regards from Vienna and we all, we all hope to meet each other again early next year. Thank you and goodbye.